together um, with an eye towards um, we're going to do some surveying this summer, talking more directly. Um, so part of what we want to get in this last bit is we'll, we'll have some conversation towards the end about if you could ask either people sitting in the theater or people not sitting in the theater that you think should be in the theater, anything you wanted to ask them, what would that be? What are the assumptions that we bring to our thinking about audiences? So that's that's a we're going to do some work on that this summer, and then um, a meeting in the fall or the early winter at Arts Emerson. Um, where we will take a bunch of the things that we've gleaned and learned, put them together, um, put a different lens on it, and, and help disseminate it. The project is um, funded in large part by the Doris Charitable Trust um, Fund for National Projects. We also will make thank you to South Coast Open School, who let Alan use their research, research that he had done for them mm -hmm. on money stuff, and of course here in Los Angeles, so thank you to Terrence Elliott Stage Alliance and to um, the Center Theater Group for hosting us today. So, and we get, I get a couple of chairs for our like, Yeah, so we spread great. out a little yeah. bit and a couple of more chairs. And so really quickly before we jump to some specific questions, um, we got some of the questions this morning to get a smaller drill down in the morning. Just really quickly, just not be right. Sure. Yeah. 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 But this is, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Yes, it's, uh, well, this is a great opportunity for me to remind you all that you are being uh, broadcast on uh, HowlRound TV right now, so hi. Um, this is your camera. Um, and the hashtag is triple play, only without the vowels in triple. Could you spell that for some <laughs> Hashtag T-R-P-L play. Thank you for asking.
Kelly Donnelly. I also work at Cornerstone. My title is Director of Engagement. I'm Brian Kolbach. I'm a playwright and I'm the marketing manager at Fossil Sport. I'm Nick Salomon. I'm a playwright and an actor. I'm Michael Sale. I'm the executive director for Fossil Sport, as well as the chair of the leadership council for the Asian Producers League. I'm Jenny Bird. I'm the executive director of River Street Theater Company, and I am also on the leadership council. I'm Leslie Thomas, I'm a playwright and an avid theater goer. I'm Richard Johnson, I'm the former artistic director of the Malibu Stage Company. Hi, Sandy. And I'm now with Zuma Repertory Theater, I'm an actor, producer, director. I'm Catherine Noon, I'm the artistic director of the Ghost Show Company. Uh, we do all ensemble devised collaborative creative work. I'm a director and an actor, and I am an associate professor at Loyola Marymount University in the theater department. I'm Henry Murray. I am literary manager and one of our uh, playwrights in residence at Rogue Machine Theater in Los Angeles. I am Mark Blankenship. I am the editor of an online magazine and a couple of film projects at Theater Development Fund in New York. And today I am your scribe. <laughs> Great. So, um, oh, yes, two more. The two in the back. Oh, one lady I cannot see. There you are. Hi. Oh, I'm Tiffany Moon. I am um, the general manager of Ohio Theatre Conference and a California repertory. I'm John Flynn. I'm the artistic director of Rogue Machine Theater. Great. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who is here this morning for coming back. And thank you for all who are coming in fresh this afternoon. Um, in the material that we sent out to you, and hopefully many of you had a chance to look at it, there was um, there was a piece of research that we asked Alan Brown from Wolf Brown to do. Alan is a pretty well-known researcher, um, looking mainly at the way audiences engage with the arts of all kinds, um, all around the English-speaking world, really. And um, we had asked him to um, not to do new research, but to, to take data that he had already collected, either from the intrinsic impact work that um, Peter Bayeria had commissioned, and literally we had um, a, well over 20,000 surveys that he could pour through to look at there, and also work that he had done with South Coast Rep and with Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago to see, see what he was finding there. And in all of that work, we had not really filtered for new work specifically, and that was where we were starting with this. So Alan thought that the, the closest thing that he could see from where we did look at and ask some specific questions around was with, quote unquote, risky work. So that's where that whole analysis of risk taking came from, because that's where we had more, um, more of a filter. And um, I think you will see, and, and Alan was fascinated to find some things that were um, unexpected for him. First of all, he posits that there's this sort of spectrum um, among audience, in, in, in individual audience member, around their propensity for risky work, right from, I'm going to go from left to right from sort of risk averse. I really don't want to see anything that's pushing my envelope. I want to go to things that I'm comfortable with, then that's what I want to do. To risk tolerant, like, well, I'll write if I have to, well, maybe. Um, to something more in the middle, and then to risk seeking. I actually think this is fun. I want to try something that's going to be new to me, you know, blow my socks off, all the way over to what the, on the far side of the spectrum, sees being sort of co-creative in the work that, that the audience member has some feeling that they're that they're engaged in some way in the creation of work. And, and none of this is about, this is not a value judgment. One of the things that, that Alan in, in this work with, around the intrinsic impact that we're finding is that um, we used to have a section of it called aesthetic growth. And really we're finding it's more about aesthetic enrichment that there's a reason why people keep going back to the Christmas Carol year after year after year after year, or to the Nutcracker, or why they want to go hear Mozart for the umpteenth zillionth time. It's because they are reconnecting with meaning. 
It's meaningful. It's really rich. And that is not to be where we should none of us take anything away from that experience and there's real validity to it. And of course, all of us, you know, might find a time when that feels really wonderful and a time when we want to go have our socks blown off. But there are some people for whom that is where their comfort zone is and what they want to do most of the time, and others who are way over here on this sort of other end of the spectrum. So that was one thing that he found. And then he posits that there might be kind of a matrix that a lot of what we were talking about this morning around audience engagement techniques, that there's something to that in the more engaged people are in different ways of approaching the work, of processing the work, of pre-show um, pre work, post-show, reading about it, that that makes you readier and have a greater propensity for risky work. So for instance, one of the things that was surprising to him and to us was that the people who have the greatest propensity for risk-taking in the theater are, well, people who make theater, sort of, yeah, but even more than that, people who read plays. Like, who does that? But people who are at home <laughs> reading plays on their own for fun, those people are by far the likeliest that you can, you can, they'll come in and watch anything, and you can blow their socks off, right? So that, group, and they're also, this makes sense, they're also probably going to be the ones who are coming to your readings and to your workshops, because they have, they have just a dexterity with the form itself. So there was some, some sort of a, a matrix there, that he was finding. And then the other thing that was interesting to us that he feels that there's some sort of connection between the two is this idea that exists in the education world of proximate learning. So that what they're finding in the education world is that we, we as students, we learn the best and the thing that we're trying to learn is just sort of just beyond where we currently are. Just <coughs> beyond that that place of knowledge where we already sit. And so he is wondering if this is the same, if the same sort of thing would be true in risk-taking theater, right? So that if you, as, as an artistic director, the one who fell on his face and said, artistic directors do this from time to time, and it's true, like if you're wanting to do this kind of work way over <coughs> here, but your senses, your audience is over here, can you move them over a period of time by providing them with this sort of proximate learning so that it actually moves them along a scale um, of readiness to be able to receive and process riskier work. Or, as they posited when we were in Washington, is it really better instead to simply re to create a new audience for each new piece for whom that proximate learning is, that's their thing, right? It's just beyond their reach. They are in the sweet spot for that play. And if that's so, what do you do with those people who keep coming back when you call them subscribers or just sort of regular regular folks for you. So those were some things that we wanted to, to just have you respond to. And for the playwrights and artists in the room, many of you are wearing several hats. Think about sort of where does your work lie at as theater companies? Where where does your work lie when it comes to taking risk? Is just doing a new play well, risky? And also another one is for whom is your work risky? And for whom is it risky? Risk is different depending on and how do you how do you think about the audience when you're thinking about the work that you're either creating or the work that you're presenting and how do you bring them in or make them prepared for the work that they're about to see or help them process and does that help get more people in, and does that help engage more people and different kinds of people in your work so if you always thinking thinking about the audience thinking about the work that you're either creating or producing so, yeah. I mean, I, I think we left off in this, this session this morning, we left off talking about diversity and inclusion in different voices. And I think that that's a great um, place to begin with. Right. Mm -hmm. And that idea, like, like I just said, um, and I, I just want to say that um, I think, you know, a lot of times how we ex assess risk is by experience, right? So if we've seen a lot of examples of something being successful, or like, and you know, and the next play kind of looks like that, we're like, okay, that's successful. And I think, you know, that's uh, the place in where, in which I'm really interested in that question of like, okay, who is your assumption about your audience? Mm -hmm. And who are you leaving out of that? I think that becomes really important because I do feel like the history of this theater is um, dominated by white male voices. You know, um, but LA is 70% non-white, it's 50% lady. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, 
do feel like there's a lot of things that are happening in that unconscious calculation of the assessment of risk that have to do with what we're familiar with that leave out that audience. And I think that can sometimes be reflected in the way that we talk about our work. I mean, I know just nationwide, when I look at, at the way that shows are marketed at, at, at theaters, I notice sometimes there's this, there's this pernicious thing that I think is very subtle that is, um, is very common where you see a work that's by, you know, um, a white guy, you know, as being touted for what it says about you, whereas there are subtle cues sometimes in the way that we promote or talk about works that are from um, like people of color or, or from ladies where it's like a window onto them, mm. you know? It's a very subtle thing that happens that I think primes our audience and teaches them how to, how, you know, but really like, if I'm gonna see Chekhov, that 19th century landowner, owner, Russian landowner, is no more, um, no more relatable to me than you know, uh, the like middle class Latino family. No, and we've yeah. had, in fact, um, some artistic directors who said, who took exception to, at the beginning to the idea that the new play equaled risky. What well, was risky for them was doing the classic in the can because their audience was expecting something else. Mm -hmm. So I think that's exactly right. And some of it. So that that's kind of what this is. A, we're interested in is when you, what's risky and you know, issues of diversity is the risk in moving outside whatever you have into whoever is not in your theater. Is it an age diversity? Did we talk some about economics this morning? I mean, where are what what when you think about it, what helps you as a producer, you as a writer, or a director or a generative artist move across the line to a place that's a little skewer, right? Because that's what we're trying to tease out here are the things that make that make that leap a little bit, not so much a leap, it's just, again, moving along that continuum. So I'm curious what kinds of things other folks might have done, yeah. Yeah, one, one of the things which I also got from the morning session, and it's a little bit discouraging, I guess, when you're talking about research, but it harks back to the William Goldman line about Hollywood, which is nobody knows anything. <laughs> you really have to try any approach you can take, because uh, you know, Michael Shepard was talking about creating things and making them into events. Other people were talking about having like a circus atmosphere at times in the lobby. Others were talking about academic um, you know, talks with playwrights beforehand, things afterwards. And you just really don't know what's going to work on a general scale, because every play is different, every theater is different, every audience is different. And so you've got to really, I think, approach each on a case-by-case -case basis and say, what can we do that will liven this up? What can we do that will make this an event happening, something that people will want to come to, will want to talk about afterwards, will want to bring their friends in? Yeah. Um, because the, my company does all on-bubble device work, so it's a, it's a long process, and we're more focused on process than product. And what we have found that's because it's, it is hard to get audiences because they don't know what they're coming to see. It's nothing's tried and true. It's all an experiment. Could be a big, giant flop. But, but what we have found recently that has been really helpful is engaging our audience and new audience in the process of development so that they are sort of there every step of the way. I don't know if it's just all you've spoken of this morning. They're there every step of the way and they give feedback and they come back to see how their, you know, if their feedback has made a difference. So they end up having some sort of ownership of the piece by the time it's done. So that, that at least for us, that has been a new wrinkle that has really been helpful. In has there been enough people, though, in that process to sort of increase your you know, patron base? Yeah, there has. I mean, that being said, it's not huge, but it definitely has increased exponentially from when we started doing that. And then we've started offering workshops about twice a year. And we get civilians in those workshops because they're curious about how the pieces are developed. So that further sort of engages them more in, in a buy-in into feeling like they're part of something. And that's been, and that's been a big difference. And it has been exponential. Can I just say for the gentleman in the back, there's chairs over here. Yeah. Like the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've um, it's interesting because I work with a theater company in New York that does classical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
and God bless them, I'm trying to push them a little bit more experimentally with their approach to the classics, but they, they tend to have a, a fairly traditional approach. But we do the same thing because we're working in site-specific places in Central Park and Boundary Park and Prospect Park. And our, our entire uh, rehearsal process is completely open to the public. And we find people, you know, that have an hour free in the park while we're rehearsing following us along. And that has really helped us in terms of audience building. Um, so that sort of thing can happen even when you're doing much more traditional things of like, like check, last season we did check off, we did see all the tempest. And uh, in both those situations, we had uh, some real followers that were very engaged in the process. You know. And you found that they actually came to the show. Oh, yes, and, right. and brought friends. Mm -hmm. And then engaged with, with us afterwards. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. could talk intelligently about the process. It was really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. So for both of you, did you find that the audiences that were coming to these developmental elements, did they already have a language to understand what they were seeing? Or did you have to give them training of some sort to able to comprehend what they were watching? Um, I think in... We, we had a discussion before we, pre we present work in progress, and then we have a discussion afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so right. there's there's a conversation, but it's not like a primer or something. I, but I, I just yeah. remember, like, yeah. like, if I, like if I went to see it, yeah. but like something that would, yeah, like if I went to see a dance show, right. I could watch a dance development, but I wouldn't have any concept. Right, right. I mean, because the work is like based on different things and different source material, we will have that kind of material available mm -hmm. to them like some of the source material, some of the articles, some of the things like that. So they have an idea of where we sort of started before we even got on our feet. So they have it. Mm -hmm. I sense from your question, because you, you're, I'm not going to do, you, I'm not going to do all the initials, right? You can do them, but it, okay. how do you cross, you're interested in crossover and from one sector to the next sector of your, I was, trying, I, I was <clears throat> trying to avoid that because I want to hear what everyone else was going to say because we did have a morning session. Uh, but one of the things we discussed was the fact that how do you get, like, we were talking about uh, racial parities, like, well, people of color can go to see a show that is primarily a white show and with a primarily white audience, and we're, we will come and see that. But those same white audiences won't come to see the show that's in a Latino company or a black company or a gay company. And try, trying to figure out how to make that happen, to make them either feel comfortable coming because sometimes the neighborhoods are a little sketchier, a little you know, a little bit scarier for people who are not of color and those, you know, but are just trying to figure out are these people willing to take a risk to come and see something that they may not feel that might not fall into what their general world is. They're making them think outside of the box. So and strategies about strategies about might that. have moved forward on that. Or is not that we just have. So that's the black voice in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's me. So, uh, you know, speaking for all black people in all of us. Uh, you know, it's just that, because this is, this is in my own personal experience, which is all black experiences, um, it's that going to see a show at the Amund, or certain, I won't say any names, but seeing a show at certain theaters where I walk in and I'm the only black member in the entire audience and I get the response of like, what are you doing here? Why, were, why are you having this experience when I went to go see Masha, Olga, Ma Masha, Vanya, Sonia, and Spike? It's like the experience of people looking at me like, why are you here for this experience? This has nothing to do with you. And, and then all of a sudden it's like, I, I feel that a lot. Y'all may not, some people come here will feel that, but it's very disheartening. It makes me, if I weren't a theater geek, I would, I would go, you know what, my people, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna come sing a shit, period. It's a little bit too tall. Well, there's that too, the, and the seating is like this big, y'all can look on that next time too. Um, but it's like, you know, I wanna know, it's like, but when I start speaking to people sitting around me, then they go, oh, you're a theater person, well, what do you do? And then we start talking about different theaters, and it gets them engaged, and like, oh, maybe I should go see that too. But we don't, and if I'm doing a sitting in at the Nate Holden, and there's no white people there to have that experience with, to like, you know, to talk to, it's like, how do we make this crossover start to happen? Yeah. Right, and we talked some beyond that about kind of crossover and pollination within this with, community. Within which our communities as well. You know, how can we help, you know, make this happen kind of with partnerships, or right? right. just basically conversation or friending or talking to each other, you know? 
Yeah, but don't you feel that it's the people that are doing diverse theater that are reaching out to each other? I mean, it's East-West. You know, it's um, uh, Shelton and Pasadena. You know, it's the people whose mission is diversity that we're kind of reaching out to each other. But, you know, we, we're all doing this. I mean, we're all part of the Los Angeles theater community. Why aren't we, re why aren't all of us reaching out to each other and, and supporting each other? You know what I mean? I mean, I, I'm not sure, but I think that uh, a human story is a human story, and the, uh, you know, a Latino woman or man would, you know, relate to any other story and vice versa, right? So um, I, I just feel like so many, and I know because at LATC, we're so busy trying to run that place, you know, <laughs> trying, you know, trying to, um, you know, figure out the programming and how to get people in the seats and stuff that we were very insular and, and I think all of us kind of kind of do that with each other or maybe not maybe it's just us that we don't know anybody right I don't know so I feel that way sometimes we go and we're like hey we don't know anybody but um, I, I just feel like there has to be more and we, what we talked about in, earlier was that many times the only time that um, a, a company reaches out to us is because they're going to do a Latino show and that's the only time they will approach us and say, hey, can you guys do an e-class for us? Or can you guys you know, reach out to your audience? Which is great. And we don't mind doing that. But we, we also find that it's not reciprocal sometimes. You know, that when we reach out to them, then we'll go, oh, well, well, we're not sure if this is right for our audience. You know, kind of and what she's talking about, though, is like sort of the larger house theaters mm -hmm. who come to like the gay theater or the Latino theater or the, you know, uh, Asian American theater and say, hey, we're doing this show, please promote us, and then we send our material back, and they're like, ooh, some of our audiences are not gonna like that, so no, and it's like. So then the question becomes, how do we, are there ways, thinking about what we're trying to drill down on in this work, is are there ways that we, you can, to activate the audiences to do the work? Because if the, right, what are ways that you, because when, when your folks go, you, the audiences don't understand the stuff about sharing or not sharing, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we move them along the spectrum? And have there been, when you were talking about a partnership with the museum and doing Marcus's play, African American play with the Latino audience, I mean, how, I, have people had successful examples of moving their audiences through this, even if kind of institutionally, the institutions are in the way of that? Well, we're just so, I'm with the LATC as well, but we just started this program with Noise Within and East West Players and ourselves. And it's very it's still developing, but the first Sunday of each of our runs, at least for us, we're giving a set of tickets for free for the Noise Within to give away to their <coughs> audience and East West will give away to their audience. They're gonna do the same to us. So that it's not sort of a, a cost prohibitive and we're telling our and then our audiences know that we are artistically aligned with these other groups yeah. and we it's a trial run. We literally haven't done it yet. But this was <laughs> But this is what we've been trying to do. Uh, and Noise Within moved to another space, and I think that's what sort of started it. Um, they realized they're in a very diverse space, but their programming wasn't diverse, mm -hmm. so they reached out. You know, I, I think what, what you two are hitting on, and Mike as well, is the key to increasing the audience, which is not necessarily to go after what does the audience want and get from them, because they'll say whatever, but is sessions like this where we are talking among each other, where we get to know each other, and say, oh yeah, I'll promote your show, we'll give tickets to it, because I think that the more the audiences realize that we're all in it together, and that if your theater is promoting this show, there's something of value to it, you might want to go see it. And that if it comes, and I hate to say from the top down, but in other words, if it comes from the theaters cooperating, and the people who are putting the art together, cooperating, I think you can bring the audience along because then it becomes a real community which is lacking because, you know, let's face it, we all have our own little turfs that we have to protect. And it's sort of, oh, I don't know that. But if we all jump in and say, there's enough audience for everybody, let's just get them all in by there's not enough audience. Are we all sharing the same 4,000 people who are going to the TV? 
Well, we've got to create more than the four thousand. That's a much larger question. No. But again, that I think happens the more you yeah. go out and you, you know instead of protecting your turf, you have to protect your turf a little bit. But go out and give free tickets to you know the first weekend of a show, which people might otherwise not know about at all, and say, yeah, go to this. Okay, you and then well, so, sort of, sort of based on what you were saying, but what, one of the things that I find is a company that um, that actually often is the one that, that, that most of the theaters are pursuing of our audience. Right? We are in that sketchy neighborhood where you talk about with non-traditional theater audiences and lots. And so any time that somebody wants to do a show that is uh, African American, like yeah. you know, I didn't even know I was going to show the last year. Yeah. And my response is always, of course, Joe. But I also say you're not going to get our audience. That the, 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 the answer is not uh, that they simply don't know you exist. That they're coming to our the, coming to our theater is a risk, and we're the only play that most of them are the only company that most of them want to come to. The times that we have been successful is when the theaters take a bigger risk than that. Rather than saying we'll give you tickets or we want you to promote it, they say we want you to build something with us that will make your audience see your company at our space. And example of that was here in this building when we were doing a uh, show called Riot of the Volume about the 1965 riots. Um, and in this building, Dr. Wander Smith was doing this piece on Rodney King. And they asked us to bring our artistic team together for a discussion about the Los Angeles, about those two riots, about the issues around it. So people weren't coming because we were giving them tickets to CTG, frankly, they wanted to come. They were coming because the Watts Village Theater Company was coming to see TG to have a, a piece of discussion and to create something in which our communities could talk. That brought a hundred and some people in Watts uh, to the <coughs> Five 
years that God was there. And the single ticket from Latinos went from nothing to 7%, which was a huge number. But I left in 95, and I think the next play happened like in 2005. <laughs> you know, Chavez Ravine. You know, that's, that's like, you know, 10 or 15 years later, so the alliance was not coming back. It, you know, it's true. It's, it has to do with, with that. I don't care how many community outreach programs we do. If we're not going to produce the work, people are not going to come. In in Los Angeles where there's so many small theaters, I think there's a level of risk that I don't know if who's already talked about. Sorry about that, just talk. But um, <laughs> but besides the gap between whether something is traditional or experimental or in terms of cultural diversity, the biggest risk I hear I heard audience members speak about is quality. Is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? And I am not going to go unless, because I, I have found so many hungry theater patrons in Los Angeles. I mean, I think it's, a, it's very low hanging fruit that, that is there for the picking. Except the fear is, the risk is, am I going to go to the theater and be utterly bored, or it's not going to be top quality, or it's going to be amateur? And, and there's going to be something about it that's going to turn me off and I'll waste my time. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this community, particularly, there's a, 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 a real perception of that that we have to do, that we, we're doing something about. And, and I don't know what the answer is. I mean, when do we go to something? It's when Jessica, who I respect, says, this show is really good. Oh, OK, then I'm going to go to it because she told me that. So do you, do you think, talk about it a little bit more, do you think that civilian audiences, I'm interested kind of what fuels this understanding that they're worried about quality, and what if any, what they mean about quality, and what you think you could, right? I mean, because there's a, this is in the, what do we want to ask, is there's a, we all bring a, I know exactly what you mean, but I'm bringing assumptions to that. So maybe drill down a little bit more about what makes you feel. And some people were nodding their heads that this was a big issue. So I'm curious about it. Well, I, I, I would say that um, the audiences are very sophisticated here. So I don't think, you know, I think we have to assume that they will be there if, if, if what we're doing is excellent enough. Mm -hmm. um, not that there's another <coughs> level we're talking about. Um, but I don't know, I'd like to hear what other people have to say about this. John behind you is pretty good. This is a particular, I, I talk about this all the time, so many of you have already heard this. But I think this is a particularly lost a problem that is a Los Angeles problem. And it, it has to do with the fact that many theaters here exist to serve their artists as opposed to existing to serve the community. Uh, and, because, and, and I don't mean, oh, like we are playwrights theater, and we're there to serve the playwrights. I don't mean that. I mean, I mean they're there because, well, now we're going to do this play, so, so Jane can play this part, or you know, now I'm going to do this because I want to be seen in this way by the larger industry here in town. So, this has been an issue in this town. I started the theater here in 1977 or 78. And I left theater and went into television. And I, I was a television producer for many years. And I came back to theater. And this has been a problem since the 70s. It was a problem then, and it's a problem now. Um, there, there is, and, and what, because what happens is, People do plays for the wrong reasons and a lot of plays are simple. And then our civilians come go to a play and it's not very good, and then they say, I don't want to go again. Uh, I don't go to small theater again. Yeah, I won't go to small I won't go to small theater again. And you can bring theater because yeah. and you hear it over and over, you know, there's and so theater. many vanity projects that happen that are just horrid. You know, it's like, you know, we've all been there, we've all gone to see our friends play. 
And you know, we know it sucks, but you try to, you know, say, and we should just tell them it sucks, stop doing it. Maybe we take that up, as I do, that's why we don't have any friends. <laughs> but no, because it ruins the quality of Los Angeles theater. If people, I mean, I know, I, I'm trying to be nice here today, but I can't. But if people start saying, people stop doing shit theater, it's like, then guess what? They need, they need to hear it. And, you know, and you know, I know there's a producer's thing that's being started, but even that's starting to be watered down a bit with like who that's sort of being let into this producer's league. You know, it's like, and I hope someone talks about that. Yeah, I said it. And, um, but it needs to be No, Speak on it. Michael, you speak on it. At the mid size producer's league, it is very strict on who did it. But it is also an intimate. Yeah, there are there are definite um, eligibility requirements that are actually higher standards than even uh, probation awards, which I'm on that committee as well. And that's a constant conversation. We just had a day long If it, if it's any help for different reasons, this fear about quality and it being what I call a career-ending moment for a new audience member has come up. Almost everywhere that we've been. So I actually think that for different reasons, it's in different communities, but the, the, the fear and the question about the responsibility of all of us to deal with the fact that if people don't Thank you. 
we have a, a, a large space that we're dedicated to all these theaters and having a bare show of the best show of it would be a centralized place and then you go and see the menu and you say, oh, this is the world. Like, get what they're going for. When, like, no play is perfect, right? When do we decide? 
decide that the things that we're excited about outweigh the things that we don't understand it. And I think that that is often very much a site of implicit bias in the sense of being very rigorous about our conversation, about who are we speaking to in the place that we are. I think that has to balance that to be a factor. Yeah, yeah.
commercials and American Pickers. If we go to a movie theater, we'll notice that the movie theaters have the same small audiences that our theaters have. Our theater is a 99-seat theater. Sometimes we fill it up and sometimes we don't. I went to see Nebraska the other night. There were about 50 people there. They couldn't have filled a 99-seat house either. It happens that we're at a time in the development in our society where there are so many other things going on that you can go home and turn on BBC and you can watch Henry V with somebody that you know, commercial free, or you can go to a theater, maybe. I have made a real effort to, to create audiences for us. When I produced Blood Knot last year, I went to every African American church in central Los Angeles and stuck postcards on the windshields during church service. And I know that when you go to Nate Holden, you get a different audience than, than you get in Malibu. You go to Nate Holden, and someone will yell from the audience, she did not slap him. <laughs> People in, in, in other uh, inner city theaters actually participate, mm -hmm. which is super different and super cool. But when I got those same audiences to come out to our place, they, did, they were quiet. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
yeah. about ticket prices. I think the other thing we need to recognize is that this conversation is different than it would have been 30 years ago. And we need to recognize that we're in a time where there, where the middle class is shrinking, where there's like profound income inequality, where people are struggling with levels of debt that can't be compared to where we were 30 years ago. And so, and I feel like, I mean, as somebody who makes a nonprofit salary and has for my entire life, I think very carefully before I spend, you know, forty dollars or fifty dollars. If I made if I made fifty thousand dollars a year, if I made sixty thousand dollars a year, much less seventy thousand, a hundred thousand, sure, I would take that risk all the time. But um, but the fact is is that the middle class in this country has shrunk, and we have to we have to address the reality of that. I think we either have to cater to an attenuated, a smaller number of very wealthy people, or we have to really en engage with the question of who is able to take that risk to put down that amount of money. So it's just about the ticket price, just because we were talking about this program. Yeah. So at LADC, one season, Cornerstone came and did Cafe Vida, and they had a lot of pay what you can night. And that particular show was the most financially successful of our whole season. Mm -hmm. And we were all like, Oh my gosh, what does this mean? And you know, I know the Cornerstone model works really well for Cornerstone, and it's combined with all of their community outreach, but they were overselling a 300 seat house that we struggled to fill each season, and so that was really eye-opening for us. And we do talk about, are we devaluing our tickets because we have a special $10 ticket sometimes? We talk about this all the time, about Gold Star, but there, there has to be some different model where I think access, giving certain communities access or certain um, you know, different classes access by lowering the price or finding a different model that it can work because Cornerstone, at least in our space, was really financially successful and that was very eye-opening for us and caused us to really think about what we had the one time we had a player and said that serving community more. And, and so when we talk about price points and, and quality, I mean, I for one don't think uh, another theater's quality has anything to do with this community theater at all. It's what we do that has to do. I mean, it's, it's more than quality. It's the value that we are giving into our community. It's the need that we are, are feeling mm -hmm. that makes people show up. But if I start to extrapolate that into the entire Los Angeles area, we, and I fought my my board on this and, and with great success, we will fail if we start to say, this is how they make money at Boston Court, this is how they make money at CTG, this is how they do, this is what their audiences are doing, we will not succeed because we will be serving a different community, a different need at which we are not, um, which is not what we do. Where our success has always come is by identifying the need in our community and identifying a value that we can And how do you do that? How do we do it? It starts with programming. Um, absolutely, positively, it starts with programming. And, it's, and, and the other thing that we have is uh, have built up a trust. And I don't know if it's about quality, but I think it's about quality in part. I think it's all also about uh, authenticity. I think it's about um, mm -hmm. shared values. I think it is about um, uh, a need for dialogue. I mean, when I talk about community and wants, it's not like there's one wants. <laughs> so I start talking about all of your communities. Jose, yeah, I think this is a conversation that we're having a lot in, in, in North theater for quite a bit. Because like, every, every time people want to do a survey, they say, who's your competitor? Mm -hmm. And the truth is, no, and we're so specific. I mean, it's not like we can't compete with anybody. We don't do like anybody. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
it's like it's so the work is so specific to work community in a way that that was the only thing you can compare with that mean or compare it to itself mm -hmm. is the work that we try to do as responding to the community that we try to work with. So it's the same. You know, If the people in this room who 
who will be in walkers and by the time that theater has a huge resurgence, as we talked about. He's like, we're Well, big stop. But she will never be in a walker lady. Yeah. Yes, is that, exactly. you know, is that, does an audience, is an audience aware of that? 
Right. right. Plays written by white men, just so you all know, are universal, and plays written by anybody else are, you know, niche. Yes. I'll let you to the windows of people who you don't know that they're nice to the Yes. But the, I mean, one of the things that's realized is that a lot of times the producers and the artistic directors have no knowledge of anyone but the white circle of world, the little white world they live in. So they don't think it's not. It's not. They might not be a racist, but they don't think about anyone of color because there's no one in their world of it's different than the color that they see on the back of their hand, and that is a huge problem. You know, particularly like when you said earlier, producing that black show or that, you know, Indonesian show where, you know, I'll try it once. Oh, black people, you messed it up. You should have had a bigger audience, so now we're not going to do it. Yeah. It's like because that's that, that, oh, I can release my guilt now. I tried it once, no. it didn't work, and guess what? Yeah, exactly. But to be fair, Michael, we all know people our own age, too. You know, we, we all know people kind of in our economic group. I mean, I feel like that it's, that it, reaching out is not just a, an ethnic problem, it's, it's across the board. Well, I totally terms agree. Of being insular in some way. I totally that. agree with that, but I think when, you know, I, I can look at someone in this room and go, well, that person looks 18, they can be 35. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, but someone looks at me, they're not going to see me. Right. Oh, yeah. you might not be black. No, that's <laughs> not going to happen. You know, so I think there's a but, little bit there, but I totally agree with what you're saying. That's all a big part of it. It's a bad way. It's a, like if you study social psychology, you know, we have all of these short ends in our minds about like the way that we perceive without thinking, right? So there's something called the outgroup homogeneity effect, right? Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry. <laughs> the outgroup homogeneity effect. So it is a, it's a mental bug that exists with everybody. When you see somebody that you um, define as other or as a member of an outgroup, and you see an example of something from that, you are likely to think that it is more universal than it otherwise is. Now the thing with like women, people of color, you know, we have so much experience with um, white men, straight white men in this culture, right? We don't have like there, there's a kind of lessening of that effect because you're exposed to all of these different images, right? But I do think that there is something for um, that happens within like artistic directors, these people that you know who don't have as many experiences with whatever is perceived as an outgroup, where they inappropriately sometimes universalized. So I worked at a theater a while ago. We did a production of um, American Buffalo by David Merritt. It did very well. It did very poorly. And nobody was like, oh, I guess people don't like plays by white playwrights. I guess people don't like David Merritt. That didn't happen, right? But I'm wondering, like, what are the conversations that happen when you have your South um, East Asian play that comes up that does that, right? Um, and I think, you know, that upper homogeneity effect is something that you really got to be aware of. I want to drink with you so bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what a good idea. Uh, so we're at that. Some of us have to go. No place to go. So just so oh. you know, um, <laughs> this is obviously the end of today, but we really do vehemently hope that this is not the end of the conversation that we're having. And so by the end of this week, you will receive an email from me, Mark Blankenship. Look for that name in your inbox. I'll probably be really blank. But you're going to be receiving an email that will give you a link to a private webpage within the TDF magazine that will allow all of the participants in all six cities to continue to post comments and messages to each other, but that will be limited to us. So we can continue to feel that we're having a conversation that is still exploratory together. And we would invite you and encourage you and love it if you did come to this site that we'll be giving the link to later this week and continue to talk up to us and let us know about the ideas that Claire that were not clear to you until tonight or tomorrow that you want to make sure get put in to the thinking that's happening. And that's where when we start trying to actually craft surveys, there'll be some stuff there for people to respond to because I really think we need to get input from you guys as much as right. And before we go, thanks again to Terrence and the LA Stage Alliance and to Center Theater Group and everyone, all of you, for being here. It's a great conversation. So, thank you. Hi, how are you?